De Profundis by Oscar Wilde, Part 1 Suffering is one very long moment. We cannot divide it by seasons. We can only record its moods and chronicle their return. With us, time itself does not progress. It revolves. It seems to circle round one center of pain. The paralyzing immobility of a life every circumstance of which is regulated after an unchangeable pattern so that we eat and drink and lie down and pray, or kneel, at least for prayer, according to the inflexible laws of an iron formula. This immobile quality that makes each dreadful day in the very minutest detail like its brother seems to communicate itself to those external forces the very essence of whose existence is ceaseless change of seed time or harvest of the reapers bending over the corn or the grape gatherers threading through the vines of the grass in the orchard made white with broken blossoms or strewn with fallen fruit of these we know nothing and can know nothing for us there is only one season the season of sorrow the very sun and moon seem taken from us outside the day may be blue and gold but the light that creeps down through the thickly muffled glass of the small iron barred window beneath which one sits is gray and niggard it is always twilight in one's cell, as it is always twilight in one's heart. And in the sphere of thought, no less than in the sphere of time, motion is no more. The thing that you personally have long ago forgotten, or can easily forget, is happening to me now, and will happen to me again tomorrow. Remember this, and you will be able to understand a little of why I am writing, and in this manner writing. A week later... I am transferred here. Three more months go over, and my mother dies. No one knew how deeply I loved and honored her. Her death was terrible to me, but I, once a lord of language, have no words in which to express my anguish and my shame. She and my father had bequeathed me a name that they made noble and honored, not merely in literature, art, archaeology, and science, but in the public history of my own country, in its evolution as a nation. I had disgraced that name eternally. I had made it a low byword among low people. I had dragged it through the very mire. I had given it to brutes that they may make it brutal, and to fools that they might turn it into a synonym for folly. What I suffered then and still suffer is not for pen to write or paper to record. My wife, always kind and gentle to me, rather than that I should hear the news from indifferent lips, traveled ill as she was all the way from Genoa to England, to break to me herself the tidings of so irreparable, so irremediable a loss. Messages of sympathy reached me from all who had still affection for me even people who had not known me personally hearing that a new sorrow had broken into my life wrote to ask that some expression of their condolence should be conveyed to me three months go over the calendar of my daily conduct and labor that hangs on the outside of my cell door with my name and sentence written upon it tell me that it is may prosperity pleasure and success may be rough of grain and common in fiber but sorrow is the most sensitive of all created things there is nothing that stirs in the whole world of thought to which sorrow does not vibrate in terrible and exquisite pulsation the thin beaten-out leaf of tremulous gold that chronicles the direction of forces the eye cannot see is in comparison coarse it is a wound that bleeds when any hand but that of love touches it, and even then must bleed again, though not in pain. Where there is sorrow there in holy ground, some day people will realize what that means. They will know nothing of life till they do, and natures like his can realize it. When I was brought down from my prison to the court of bankruptcy between two policemen, waited in the long dreary corridor that, before the whole crowd whom an action so sweet and simple hushed into silence, he might gravely raise his hat to me, as, handcuffed, and with bowed head I passed him by. Men have gone to heaven for smaller things than that. 
it was in this spirit and with this mode of love that the saints knelt down to wash the feet of the poor or stooped to kiss the leper on the cheek i have never said one single word to him about what he did i do not know to the present moment whether he is aware that i was even conscious of his action it is not a thing for which one can render formal thanks in formal words i store it in the treasure-house of my heart I keep it there as a secret debt that I am glad to think I can never possibly repay. It is embalmed and kept sweet by the myrrh and cassia of many tears. When wisdom has been profitless to me, philosophy barren, and the proverbs and phrases of those who have sought to give me consolation as dust and ashes in my mouth, the memory of that little lovely silent act of love has unsealed for me all the wells of pity made the desert blossom like a rose, and brought me out of the bitterness of lonely exile into harmony with the wounded, broken, and great heart of the world. When people are able to understand not merely how beautiful its action was, but why it meant so much to me and always will mean so much, then, perhaps, they will realize how and in what spirit they should approach me the poor are wise more charitable more kind more sensitive than we are in their eyes prison is a tragedy in a man's life a misfortune a casualty something that calls for sympathy in others they speak of one who is in prison as of one who is in trouble simply it is the phrase they always use and the expression has the perfect wisdom of love in it with people of our own rank it is different with us prison makes a man a pariah i and such as i am have hardly any right to air and sun our present taints the pleasures of others we are unwelcome when we reappear to revisit the glimpses of the moon is not for us our very children are taken away those lovely links with humanity are broken we are doomed to be solitary while our sons still live we are denied the one thing that might heal us and keep us that might bring balm to the bruised heart and peace to the soul in pain i must say to myself that i ruined myself and that nobody great or small can be ruined except by his own hand i am quite ready to say so i am trying to say so though they may not think it at the present moment this pitiless indictment i bring without pity against myself terrible as was what the world did to me what i did to myself was far more terrible still i was a man who stood in symbolic relations to the art and culture of my age i had realized this for myself at the very dawn of my manhood and had forced my age to realize it afterwards Few men hold such a position in their own lifetime, and have it so acknowledged. It is usually discerned, if discerned at all, by the historian or the critic long after both the man and his age have passed away. With me it was different. I felt it myself and made others feel it. Byron was a symbolic figure, but his relations were to the passion of his age and its weariness of passion. Mine were to something more noble, more permanent, of more vital issue, of larger scope. The gods had given me almost everything, but I let myself be lured into long spells of senseless and sensual ease. I amused myself with being a flaneur, a dandy, a man of fashion. I surrounded myself with the smaller natures and the meaner minds. I became the spendthrift of my own genius, and to waste an eternal youth gave me a curious joy. Tired of being on the heights, I deliberately went to the depths in the search for new sensation. What the paradox was to me in the sphere of thought, perversity became to me in the sphere of passion. Desire at the end was a malady, or a madness, or both. I grew careless of the lives of others. I took pleasure where it pleased me and passed on. I forgot that every little action of the common day makes or unmakes character, and that therefore what one has done in the secret chamber one has some day to cry aloud on the housetop. 
I ceased to be lord over myself. I was no longer the captain of my soul, and did not know it. I allowed pleasure to dominate me. I ended in horrible disgrace. There is only one thing for me now, absolute humility. I have lain in prison for nearly two years. Out of my nature has come wild despair, an abandonment to grief that was piteous even to look at, terrible and impotent rage, bitterness and scorn, anguish that wept aloud, misery that could find no voice, sorrow that was dumb. I have passed through every possible mood of suffering. Better than Wordsworth himself, I know what Wordsworth meant when he said, Suffering is permanent, obscure, and dark, and has the nature of infinity. But while there were times when I rejoiced in the idea that my sufferings were to be endless, I could not bear them to be without meaning. Now I find hidden somewhere away in my nature something that tells me that nothing in the whole world is meaningless, and suffering least of all, that something hidden away in my nature, like a treasure in a field, is humility. It is the last thing left in me, and the best, the ultimate discovery at which I have arrived, the starting point for a fresh development. It has come to me right out of myself, so I know that it has come at the proper time. It could not have come before, nor later. Had anyone told me of it, I would have rejected it. Had it been brought to me, I would have refused it. As I found it, I want to keep it. I must do so. It is the one thing that has in it the elements of life, of a new life, vita nuova, for me, of all things that is the strangest. One cannot acquire it except by surrendering everything that one has. It is only when one has lost all things that one knows that one possesses it. Now I have realized that it is in me. I see quite clearly what I ought to do, in fact must do. And when I use such a phrase as that, I need not say that I am not alluding to any external sanction or command. I admit none. I am far more of an individualist than I ever was. Nothing seems to me of the smallest value except what one gets out of oneself. My nature is seeking a fresh mode of self-realization. That is all I am concerned with. And the first thing that I have got to do is to free myself from any possible bitterness of feeling against the world. I am completely penniless and absolutely homeless. Yet there are worse things in the world than that. I am quite candid when I say that rather than go out from this prison with bitterness in my heart against the world, I would gladly and readily beg my bread from door to door. If I got nothing from the house of the rich, I would get something at the house of the poor. Those who have much are often greedy. Those who have little always share. I would not a bit mind sleeping in the cool grass in summer, and when winter came on sheltering myself by the warm, close-thatched rick or under the penthouse of a great barn, provided I had love in my heart. The external things of life seem to me now of no importance at all. You can see to what intensity of individualism I have arrived, or am arriving, rather, for the journey is long, and where I walk there are thorns. Of course I know that to ask alms on the highway is not to be my lot, and that if ever I lie in the cool grass at night time, it will be to write sonnets to the moon. When I go out of prison, R will be waiting for me on the other side of the big iron-studded gate, and he is the symbol, not merely of his own affection, but of the affection of many others besides. I believe I am to have enough to live on for about eighteen months at any rate, so that if I may not write beautiful books, I may at least read beautiful books, and what joy can be greater? After that, I hope to be able to recreate my creative faculty. But were things different, had I not a friend left in the world? Were there not a single house open to me in pity? Had I to accept the wallet and ragged cloak of sheer penury? As long as I am free from all resentment, hardness, and scorn, I would be able to face the life, 
with much more calm and confidence that I would were my body in purple and fine linen, and the soul within me sick with hate. And I really should have no difficulty. When you really want love, you will find it waiting for you. I need not say that my test does not end there. It would be comparatively easy if it did. There is much more before me. I have hills far steeper to climb, valleys much darker to pass through, and I have to get it all out of myself. Neither religion, morality, nor reason can help me at all. Morality does not help me. I am a born antinomian. I am one of those who are made for exceptions, not for laws. But while I see that there is nothing wrong in what one does, I see that there is something wrong in what one becomes. It is well to have learned that. Religion does not help me. The faith that others give to what is unseen, I give to what one can touch and look at. My gods dwell in temples made with hands, and within the circle of actual experience is my creed made perfect and complete, too complete. It may be for like many or all of those who have placed their heaven in this earth. I have found in it not merely the beauty of heaven, but the horror of hell also. When I think about religion at all, I feel as if I would like to found an order for those who cannot believe. The confraternity of the faithless, one might call it, were on an altar, on which no taper burned, a priest, in whose heart peace had no dwelling, might celebrate with unblessed bread and a chalice empty of wine. Everything to be true must become a religion, and agnosticism should have its ritual no less than faith. It has sown its martyrs, it should reap its saints, and praise God daily for having hidden himself from man. But whether it be faith or agnosticism, it must be nothing external to me. Its symbols must be of my own creating. Only that is spiritual, which makes its own form. If I may not find its secret within myself, I shall never find it. If I have not got it already, it will never come to me. Reason does not help me. It tells me that the laws under which I am convicted are wrong and unjust laws, and the system under which I have suffered a wrong and unjust system. But somehow I have got to make both of these things just and right to me, and exactly as in art one is only concerned with what a particular thing is at a particular moment to oneself, so it is also in the ethical evolution of one's character. I have got to make everything that has happened to me good for me. The plank bed, the loathsome food, the hard ropes shredded into oakum till one's fingertips grow dull with pain, the menial offices with which each day begins and finishes, the harsh orders that routine seems to necessitate, the dreadful dress that makes sorrow grotesque to look at, the silence, the solitude, the shame. Each and all of these things I have to transform into a spiritual experience. There is not a single degradation of the body which I must not try and make into a spiritualizing of the soul. I want to get to the point when I shall be able to say quite simply and without affectation that the two great turning points in my life were when my father sent me to Oxford and when society sent me to prison. I will not say that prison is the best thing that could have happened to me, for that phrase would savor of too great bitterness toward myself. I would sooner say, or hear it said of me, that I was so typical a child of my age that in my perversity, and for that perversity's sake, I turned the good things of my life to evil and the evil things of my life to good. What is said, however, by myself or by others matters little. The important thing, the thing that lies before me, the thing that I have to do, if the brief remainder of my days is not to be maimed, marred, and incomplete, is to absorb into my nature all that has been done to me, to make it part of me, to accept it without complaint, fear, or reluctance. The supreme vice is shallowness. Whatever is realized is right. When first I was put into prison, some people advised me to try and forget who I was. It was ruinous advice. 
It is only by realizing what I am that I have found comfort of any kind. Now I am advised by others to try on my release to forget that I have ever been in a prison at all. I know that would be equally fatal. It would mean that I would always be haunted by an intolerable sense of disgrace, and that those things that are meant for me as much as for anybody else, the beauty of the sun and the moon, the pageant of the seasons, the music of daybreak and the silence of great nights, the rain falling through the leaves or the dew creeping over the grass and making it silver, would all be tainted for me and lose their healing power and their power of communicating joy. To regret one's own experiences is to arrest one's own development. To deny one's own experiences is to put a lie into the lips of one's own life. It is no less than a denial of the soul. For just as the body absorbs things of all kinds, things common and unclean no less, than those that the priest or vision has cleansed and converts them into swiftness or strength, into the play of beautiful muscles and the molding of fair flesh, into the curves and colors of the hair, the lips, the eye, so the soul in its turn has its nutritive functions also, and can transform into noble moods of thought and passions of high import what in itself is base cruel and degrading nay more find in these its most august modes of assertion and can often reveal itself most perfectly through what was intended to desecrate or destroy the fact of my having been the common prisoner of a common jail I must frankly accept, and curious as it may seem one of the things I shall have to teach myself is not to be ashamed of it I must accept it as a punishment, and if one is ashamed of having been punished, one might just as well never have been punished at all. Of course, there are many things of which I was convicted that I had not done, but then there are many things of which I was convicted that I had done, and a still greater number of things in my life for which I was never indicted at all. And as the gods are strange, and punish us for what is good and humane in us, as much as for what is evil and perverse, I must accept the fact that one is punished for the good as well as for the evil that one does. I have no doubt that it is quite right one should be. It helps one, or should help one, to realize both, and not to be too conceited about either. And if I then am not ashamed of my punishment, as I hope not to be, I shall be able to think and walk and live with freedom. Many men on their release carry their prison about with them into the air and hide it as a secret disgrace in their hearts, and at length, like poor poisoned things, creep into some hole and die. It is wretched that they should have to do so, and it is wrong, terribly wrong of society that it should force them to do so. Society takes upon itself the right to inflict appalling punishment on the individual, but it also has the supreme vice of shallowness and fails to realize what it has done. When the man's punishment is over, it leaves him to himself. That is to say, it abandons him at the very moment when its highest duty towards him begins. It is really ashamed of its own actions, and shuns those whom it has punished, as people shun a creditor whose debt they cannot pay, or one on whom they have inflicted an irreparable and irremediable wrong. I can claim on my side that if I realize what I have suffered, society should realize what it has inflicted on me, and that there should be no bitterness or hate on either side. Of course I know that from one point of view, things will be made different for me than for others, must indeed, by the very nature of the case, be made so. The poor thieves and outcasts who are imprisoned here with me are in many respects more fortunate than I am. The little way in Gray City or Green Field that saw their sin is small. To find those who know nothing of what they have done, they need go no further than a bird might fly between the twilight and the dawn. But for me, the world is shriveled to a hand's breadth, and everywhere I turn, my name is written on the rocks in lead. 
for I have come not from obscurity into the momentary notoriety of crime, but from a sort of eternity of fame to a sort of eternity of infamy, and sometimes seem to myself to have shown, if indeed it required showing, that between the famous and the infamous there is but one step, if as much as one. Still, in the very fact that people will recognize me wherever I go, and know all about my life as far as its follies go, I can discern something good for me. It will force on me the necessity of again asserting myself as an artist, and as soon as I possibly can. If I can produce only one beautiful work of art, I shall be able to rob malice of its venom, and cowardice of its sneer, and to pluck out the tongue of scorn.